message series. Um, we're not going to start our next big message series until September, so that has given me the opportunity to do some things and talk about some things and even uh, go through some things um, that, you know, don't usually fit into a series or whatnot. Also, lets me get creative on how we do our presentations. So today I'm going to do a uh, tag team presentation with someone who calls our church home, who I'm also glad to call my good friend. This is Dr. Fred DeYoung, and his specialty is social work. And he's done several kinds of things, like been a professor in the past, and now he does a lot of research and grant writing. But um, all that aside, what he and I want to talk to you about today is something that he and I share in common, which is that both he and I, at some time in the past, have struggled with an addiction of some kind. And he and I have both uh, benefited tremendously from the insight of something called the 12 Steps. You've probably heard of that, even if you don't know what they are. You've probably heard about them from a group called Alcoholics Anonymous. And here's very explicitly what we don't want to do today. We don't want this today to be a testimonial about overcoming addiction. We probably at some point need to talk about addiction as a church because addiction of all different kinds runs rampant among people. But Fred and I want to do something a little different today. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the 12 steps, they represent a remarkable window into some of the most basic fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. And we would like to use these 12 steps for, to help you understand, perhaps, what this whole Christian thing is about. And what I would tell you is, even those of you who have been quote-unquote Christians for a long time, you may not have appreciated with the depth or magnitude that you need to some of the things that our faith claims. And we hope that talking about the 12 steps will help you maybe grasp that a little better. Well, what Fred's going to do for us um, just in a minute is he's going to kind of give you a short history of the 12 steps just so you kind of know where it came from. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about the 12 steps themsel themselves. Would you do that for us, Fred? Sure. Yeah, take yourself back about 100 years. If you knew of someone who was abusing alcohol, or at that time opium was the, uh, the drug, um, you had no hope. Um, you weren't insane, so you couldn't go to that kind of hospital. And you weren't regarded physically sick, so you couldn't go there. You were left to uh, self-destroy, you know, alcohol poisoning or uh, liver disease. There was no hope. And, um, into that hopelessness stepped a group called the Oxford Group in England. And they began to do a Christian outreach to alcoholic men in a London area. And what happened is that they had a very small attendance, probably because many alcoholics had either rejected the Lord or were too embarrassed to confront him, right? So after some time of minimal attendance, um, the Oxford group undressed their Christian outreach to its bare essential steps. It's every biblical element of um, realizing your um, powerlessness, confessing it, and relying on God for strength. There is, Fred and I have read together, um, a book written by one of the most remarkable writers within Christianity today, a Catholic man named Richard Rohr, about the, tw the Christianity of the Twelve Steps. And he says very unabashedly in that book that the most successful church you've ever known is AA. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about that. Mm -hmm that it's very likely for most of us the most successful church you have ever heard of isn't a church at all. Why is that, do you suppose? 
well, Fred and I both have had experience with groups like it, and I suspect that we would say it's because there is a vulnerability and an openness in groups like that that is rare in church. There is an admission about who we are and who we are not, what we can do and what we cannot do in groups like that that you don't find in church. And I think Richard Rohr is right. I think there are things in these 12 steps that summarize, as Fred said, going back all the way to the Oxford group 100 years ago. They summarize the Christian faith. I think there's something very powerful about centering your life on these core or basic ideas. Mm -hmm. Fred and I have summarized the 12 steps into four different uh, pages. And we want to walk you through those pages together. Here's what you would find in steps one to three. And you go through these steps sequentially or in order. You start with this simple fact. We admit that we are powerless over our sin and that our lives are unmanageable. Only God can restore our life to sanity. That is, only he is the one who can make our life manageable. And because of that, we will turn our lives over to him. Why don't you talk about those just for a minute, Fred? Um, to quote um, a writer that I read this morning, somehow the only good ideas come from the shipwrecked, and everything else is posturing. And that pretty much sums up these steps, because um, myself included, a lot of us suffer from the grand illusion of being able to control our lives um, and our destinies, that we're competent to uh, reach our goals. And if we believe the right things and behave, then we're right with Jesus. And um, these steps force one to uh, face the truth, that grace is hard on the ego and no my life when yours may not be in perfect order and I have to rely on grace we all do to change and I have to I'm going to add to today's my 11 and a half year anniversary of being clean so. if you look at that first step you may not realize that that is an idea that is pulled directly from the scriptures. That we are powerless as human beings and that our lives left to ourselves are unmanageable. Allow me to read to you. This is St. Paul writing in his letter to the Ephesian church, chapter 4, verses 17 to 20. This is his description of how the pagans who are not Christians what they're like, what their lives are like in this town in which the Ephesian church is located. Listen to his description and see if it doesn't smack of powerlessness and being unmanageable. Paul writes, You Christians should no longer live like the pagans around you live. Their minds are futile. Their wisdom is darkened. They are excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance and because of the hardness of their hearts. They, being spiritually callous, have turned themselves over to their impulses so that now they practice every kind of impurity and greed. Futile. Darkness. Ignorance. Hardness. Callous. And because of all those things, we are turned over to merely obey our human impulses. Christianity says that's the state of being human. What you need to realize is that human beings, even ones who have been Christians for a long time, don't want to admit that about themselves. This is, Fred will tell you from his own experience, I'm sure, leading a recovery group. This is the most avoided, most denied, least often taken step of the twelve. Because we just simply don't want to admit it. That no matter who we are, whether or not we're an addict, our lives are overcome by the lesser angels of our nature. 
by our worry, by our anger, by our greed, by working too much, by hate, by apathy, by distance, by self-righteousness, by pride, you name it. We are overcome by it. And we are powerless because of it. And we don't want to admit it. This is what the Christian English poet W.H. Oden says about human nature. He writes, quote, We as human beings would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb up on the cross and let our illusions die. That is human nature. By the way, Christianity, if it's not careful, can sound a whole lot like something that doesn't resemble this. Richard Rohr, that author that Fred and I have read recently together, will say very simply, you need to be careful that if Christianity sounds like it's a religion that believes that the one with the most, with the the person with the most willpower wins, you know that at that point Christianity has stopped being good news and it's become bad news because most of us can never manage our own life if that's the standard, ever. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we choose in Christianity to acknowledge the fact that our lives are broken beyond our own repair. And we say, God, I need your help to make my life manageable, sane. I need your help for it to make any sense at all. This is what Christians do. This is what it means to be a Christian. Do you think that Jesus is just saying kind of cool spiritual aphorisms when he says the one who loses his life will gain it? Or do you think that's actually true? What do you think? Do you think that Paul, St. Paul, is just being humble because he's St. Paul after all, when he says, when I am weakest, then I am strong. Or do you think that's actually true? Why did Jesus say that he came for the sick, not the well? Do you think that's actually true? I think Fred and I would tell you, yes, those things are actually true. You will not find the life that God wants for you until you're willing to lose the one that you have. Because the one that you have isn't working. You will not be able to find what real strength is until you find out that you're extraordinarily weak. And you cannot stand on your own two feet. And Jesus is going to be a peripheral figure in your life, even if you've been in church your entire life, if you think you're well. And you only need him to clean off some of the dust in your life. Doesn't work that way. Only the sick need Jesus. That's what he said. This is the first step of being a Christian. Is to admit your life is powerless. And you turn to the only person, God Almighty, who can fix you. The next steps look like this. And you can compress them down into this summary. We make a searching, fearless, moral inventory of our life. And then we confess what we find. And then even harder yet, we actually tell God that we want him to change the things that we found instead of just pretending about them. And then we may do what may be the most hard step of all, which is, we don't stop there. Then we say we are going to go make amends for the things that we have found and the things that we have confessed and the things that we have asked God to change in our lives. We will seek people out and ask forgiveness and make amends. And then, step 10 says, you make this a regular part of your life. This is not something you do once. This is something that you do on a regular basis. Why don't you talk to us for a minute about those, Fred? I took along some of the tools of the trade. I think that I'm trying to move from Christianity as a theory to Christianity as I can practice it, the practical steps to become more like Jesus, just gradually relying on his grace. 
And I want to show you, I have a book up here that early in my recovery I, I wrote, Complacency is the Enemy. That actually comes from C.S. Lewis in Screw Tape Letters as the most valuable way to distract Christians from doing anything that Jesus would want. You know, and that's my reminder. So every Thursday night at 8, I face that book binder towards me. Complacency is the enemy. And then I, I publicly confess, or at least do an examination of the week to see if I'm using the grace God gives me to be obedient and where I've failed to confess it to the group and start counting the days that I hold to grace and don't repeat that mistake. Okay, so you might wonder, why do I keep going to a group after 11 and a half years? Um, I don't daily struggle with that addiction anymore. No, I'm struggling with other kinds of defects that keep me from being close to Jesus, which is what makes the 12 step so attractive to so many people with different kinds of problems. So. Thursday nights, we have someone who can't stop shoplifting. And we have someone who um, is a sex addict. And we have someone who can't get over himself. He says he's in recovery from being a jerk. Just very well-developed <laughs> <laughs> ego <laughs> that he needs to get over. I mean, they're, they're, it, just think of whatever your stumbling block is and being more like Jesus, and that's what you would lay on the table. And I write it on a card. Not everybody does that. And I set it up in front of the group. And I can see on the back of the card the last time I, I committed that sin. And I count my days clean. Okay. Right now I'm working on controlling behaviors. And the easiest way to count that is when I offend my wife in some way. Because I'll hear about it right away. It's easy to count. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check how long it's been. <laughs> now, these are egregious, not little things, because then I might miss them. Oh, Memorial Day was the last time. Okay. Now, that's pretty cool for a type A controlling uh, person like I used to be. So thanks be to God. Um, the other part of these steps is um, it moves straight to a fearless inventory of everything you or I have ever done wrong. And you have to write it out and then read it and have another person read it and give you feedback because we're, it's so hard to remember what you and I have done wrong. Um, <laughs> Nietzsche always says that um, our, our brains are great at cleansing our memories of stuff we did wrong. So um, I have rewritten mine several times until I quit remembering new stuff, okay, to make a thorough confession. Um, if, if I didn't do that and if the people in group didn't, you have the, what's called the recovery three-step. You keep admitting you're powerless, there's a God, and I surrender, and then it keeps going in a circle, and you don't make any progress this kind of real thorough confession has to be done. And by doing it to another person, it, it, it makes you accountable to do it well and not gloss over things. Um, there are several members in this congregation who have done that mm -hmm. with amazing grace attending it afterwards. What Fred said is true. You can tell that grace, which is a core Christian belief, it's what holds our faith together. It's cheap, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you don't move into something like this. You end up doing three-step. Mm -hmm. um, and Christianity at that point is really only theoretical to you. It's not very practical. If you don't move into something like this, you probably will acknowledge with me that many of us would love to stop at step three because step four is intimidating. And moving through those steps, it's tough. You remember this. What you won't acknowledge, God can't heal. What you won't acknowledge, God can't heal. And many Christian people, many of the Christian people I know who have been Christians a long time, 
You look at their life over the span of years and decades, and they don't seem to be changing. You know why? Because they're not doing this. Here's the attitude of the psalmist in the Old Testament that flies in the face of basic human nature, that wants to hide and forget and skirt what we really do. This is Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. The psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know the truth of my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. The only way for real change is something like this. God can always forgive. God will always forgive. You should never fear this kind of process because God will always embrace you with his mercy when you do it. You know what God can't abide? Your apathy. He's powerless against it. If you don't care, what can he do? He says in a very vivid passage in Revelation chapter 3 that that's the kind of person he spits out of his mouth. He has a hard time with it. This may be what you need. Don't miss, by the way, the step about amends. It is not enough to keep track of your life and to pay attention to the character defects or the behavioral choices that you're making that God wants you to go to work on next, like you heard Fred talk about. That's not enough. This step forces you to realize that what we call sin in our lives, it's real. It's not theoretical. And because it's real, it doesn't just hurt us, it hurts other people. And other people need us, not just to confess to them when we hurt them, but they need us to make amends for what we've done. You are not the only person who needs to be freed from your sin. So are all the other people that you're currently hurting. You remember the story of Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19? Here is this tax collector who is a pariah in his own society. Jesus shows up and Zacchaeus finds something in Jesus that he has not found anywhere else in his life. And all of a sudden, the light goes on. And a life is birthed to God right there over lunch. Do you remember what Zacchaeus did first after that happened? He made amends. All the people he had cheated as a tax collector, he went out and didn't just repay them for what he cheated. He paid them four times over. He paid them interest on what he had built them out of. He made amends. It's probably fair to say that we're not taking our behavior, what we do, and equally what we don't do toward people who need it. We are not taking it seriously until we're willing to take the concrete step of making amends. Verbalizing it and then doing something to make amends. Let's move to step 11 because it's very different from this but it's equally important. It changes the focus. Step 11 says that through prayer and meditation, we will seek to improve our conscious connection with God, praying primarily for the knowledge of his will and the ability to carry it out. Those are very carefully chosen words and exceedingly important for a Christian, not just an addict. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that mm. step, Fred? The eleventh step is something that we have to do in a s scheduled and conscious way, held accountable to our peers who are also belonging to Jesus. Because otherwise, we can, I can gloss over the truth, begin to pr pretend everything's fine. In fact, um, Com true to me and common to some of my friends who use this method of trying to become more like Jesus, if we stop doing this self-examination, confession, um, we begin to think we're just A-OK. -okay. 
we're pretty good. We're normal. Um, if, if we don't have to have a time to look deep inside ourselves, we, the illusion is we're just fine. And um, I have to say, before addiction ever happened to me, I think I went through several decades of thinking I was just fine uh, when I wasn't. Okay, so it's awfully important for my recovery, and I think anyone who's trying to recover from any sin, to do this 11th step, which is we need the knowledge of his will and the power to carry it out. Well, you don't get that knowledge. I don't get that knowledge on my own, driving down the road, working, taking care of my family, working on the house. I get it by having to be accountable and examine myself. So that's what we do on Thursday nights. You, uh, especially if you've been in church or have some Christian background, what's different about how this step describes prayer? You probably see it, right? When most of us as Christians talk about our prayer life or we pray together or even when we pray in church, what do we pray about? We pray about our needs. Right? Um, do you realize that if we're not careful, that becomes extremely controlling behavior? Hmm. I'm telling God what I think he needs to be concerned about. I wonder how often I pray that God goes, would you just shut up for a minute? I have some things I'd like to say to you, and they're not on your agenda. What a surprise. God may think something different than me. Notice what it says. That we as Christian people who understand we are powerless against our sin and we need God to free us, and he does that through the process of moral examination and confession and making amends, all the steps up to now, he needs us to pray in a distinct kind of way. And it has nothing to do with our needs. It's okay that you pray for your needs. A centerpiece of your prayer, though, ought to be this. Do you know that if you were to examine both the Old and the New Testament, and in this week's Deeper Roots email, I'm going to send you some of these. If you were to look at the prayers that we have recorded in both Testaments, they look like that. They don't look like my prayer. There are not that many prayers in the scriptures that have to do with a laundry list of need. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of prayers that have to do with knowing what God wants us to do and then having the courage and ability to do it. St. Paul prays for the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 that they would know how to love and they would have the discernment to know to whom they should love. That's that kind of prayer. At the end of Ephesians chapter 1, we are told that St. Paul prays for that church that they would know God's will and it would be revealed to them. That's that kind of prayer, right? How would the world look different? Not just your world, but the world in general, the world around you. How would it look different if we took that kind of prayer more seriously? And just listen, right? We've already figured out in these steps that my life is not my own. Because my life on my own is a mess. It is an incurable mess. But I can listen to God. What if I made it my aim in life to ask him, what do you need me to do today and to whom? And then give me the courage and ability to do it, whatever it is. Hmm. I wonder... I'll send you this week in the Deeper Roots email a few ideas about how you can do this more concretely. But let's finish with how the steps do. And this, as you have heard all along, is exceedingly congruent with the Christian faith and where it's placed in the steps. The last step says, having done the first 11 steps, you will have a spiritual awakening. And then we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Did you talk about that mm -hmm. last step mm -hmm. for a minute, Fred? 
I should say that um, part of our weekly accountability is when we end our time together, we um, fervently pray for one another. And I really think that um, what the reason several, well, actually a, a lot of lives have been changed is because we leave it up to God to finish his good work in us. Okay. Those of us who experience dramatic change, and that's everybody who keeps coming, um, we're obligated to share this method of accessing grace to other people who come across our path who are suffering. Um, I'm fortunate, I didn't think so at first, when I was publicly humiliated and caught and advertised and there was no way I could go covert after my addiction was known. Lots and lots of people find recovery and then go hide. There's no service there. Um, I think any of us who recover by grace from some desperate need really have an obligation to be Jesus to other people. Um, and that's, that's what we um, very purposely do by welcoming newcomers to the group. In fact, if someone comes for the first time and they've never been to a 12-step, we drop the whole format. Everybody does their confession all over again. So there's no judgment at all. I think it's very telling, very wise, that those who crafted this said that it is only after pursuing the first 11 steps that we can assume you've had a spiritual awakening. That leads me to ask you, so have you had one? I don't care if you think you're a Christian or not. Have you had one? How about this? I'm not sure there's any other way to have one. Right? Saying a prayer in Sunday school and writing the date down in the front of your Bible isn't the same thing. Going to church week after week is not the same thing. Liking Christian music and Christian radio stations is not the same thing. Treating your wife or husband fairly well and having pretty, you know, well-adjusted, behaviorally moderate kids is not the same thing. Knowing that Genesis is a book in the Bible is not the same thing. Okay? Is there any other way to get what many of us say that we want, which is to know God in our lives, but to do it this kind of way. You have to come to the end of yourself. And then you have to give your life to God. And then you have to willingly ask him to change the character and behavioral and attitudinal deficiencies that you are willing to go find. And you're willing to make amends and confess and then you're willing to continually, through prayer, day after day, week after week, ask him to guide you and show you what to do. This is the only way. You know why so many Christian people could not say that they experience God in their life? Because they're not willing to do this. That's why. George Barna did a study recently in which he asked, Christian people, how many people have you talked to about Jesus last year? Don't feel guilty, okay? That's not the point. The most common answer to that question by Christian people, to that question by Christian people is zero. I have talked to no one about Jesus in the last 12 months. Do you know why? Because of this. That's why. You have no reason to talk about Jesus if he has not changed your life like this. No wonder. No wonder. It is only the truly changed who get it about Jesus. That when we say things about him like he is our savior, we actually mean it. That he saved our life from the wreck that it was. This is what uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. After interacting with someone whose life would have been characterized like this, someone whose life was a complete disaster. 
And Jesus heals him and saves him. And the end of the story, after this man gets his life back, is this. Jesus says to him, quote, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. That's how it's supposed to work. Those of us who are powerless, whose lives are not manageable, and yet who have been saved from that fact through the basics of Christianity that we've expressed to you today in these 12 steps, we are the ones then who, in the words of Jesus, go home to our friends and we tell them what's happened to us and how the Lord has had mercy on us. Before we end, would you thank Fred for uh, helping me with this? today. I suspect that some of you need to, uh, you need to think. You need to do some soul searching. You need to talk to God. Because some of you may not realize it, but you heard the Christian faith today. This is what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you've never heard that before with such clarity. You need to decide whether or not you'd like to be that. Maybe you've been a Christian a long time and you realize, oh my gosh, my understanding and my living out of the Christian faith has been so superficial, so shallow. I want to give you a moment to do that, but to end, I want to finish with these two thoughts from that book that I mentioned that Fred and I have read together over the last month by Richard Rohr. He says, when you look at these 12 steps and the spirituality, the Christianity that it reveals, you remember that, quote, God does not love us because we change. God loves us so we can change. And then at the end of his introduction, he writes this little short poem as a way of summarizing everything that you've heard Fred and I say today. That this is what Christians believe. This is what the Christian faith is. And it's so good, I have it typed up and taped on my desk, so I see it every day. Richard Rohr writes very simply, we suffer to get well. We surrender to win. We die to live. We give it away to keep it. On your chairs today are some sand or tan or buff colored half sheets that look like this. They are front and back. And I'm going to play a video for you for a few minutes. And I'd like you to give God the space to talk to you about how you need to respond to what you heard today. The song you're going to hear in the video is the first about a third of it is by a new Christian group called All Sons and Daughters. And it's a song altogether appropriate for the morning called All the Poor and Powerless. you are home. 